well nourished and well nurtured, again, competent in his own skin purposeful, knows where he's going, and having, looks like he's having a good time going there, that's highly attractive to the feminine. I I used to think that if a woman wanted to tell me her problems, that meant she valued me. That meant I, I had an in. If she wanted, because that began with my mother. You know, my, my mother began telling me her problems, especially in regard to my father, at a very young age. And most women, if they have any sense of, you know, the, of vibrational energy states, they're, they're that's going to feel bad. It's going to feel creepy to them, even if they don't know why. What we're recovering from is a mistaken belief that there's something wrong with us. The feminine is, is, is the, the seeker of love, the consumer of love. So we're going to women trying to get love. We have needs. And, and because the nice guy's often hiding their needs and their wants and their sexuality, because we're afraid we're going to get a negative response. And my wife found out some of the secrets that I'd had and and she said, you know, you're not such a nice guy. You know, people think you're a nice guy, but, you know, you, you're passive aggressive and you hurt me. And you need to go get help. Dr. Robert Glover, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I've been really looking forward to talking to you. Connor, thanks for the invitation. It's good to be here. So one of the things, the first thing I wanted to ask you about was the origin story of No More Mr. Nice Guy, because so many people have read it. It's so iconic and it's so influential. Where was it? Like, where did it come from? What, whether, did it come from clinical practice? What you observed in clinical practice? Where, where did it, it come from? It, it came from my ex-wife. That, that's primarily where it came from. Um, yeah, it's nice to hear that it's iconic. Um, you know, it's... No more Mr. Nice Guy's basically autobiographical. I often say that, you know, it, it tells my story. I just use other guys, you know, lives to, to illustrate my story. And I, I often say that the book is not a record of my successes. It's a chronicle of my fuck ups. It, it's, you know, everything I did that didn't work. I thought, all right, maybe I should figure this out why it doesn't work. Um and, and even though some of it probably was influenced by my academic background, I, I have a, a doctorate in marriage and family therapy. So, you know, when I talk about things like uh, differentiation and fusion and systemics and co-creating relationship dynamics, yeah, that, that comes out of my academic background. But what it comes down to just, you know, the, the, the bare bones of nice guy syndrome, you know, that, that's my own, you know, experience of, of dealing with that dynamic in my life. And, you know, with hundreds of clients and thousands of men that I've worked with over the last 30 years who identify as nice guys. So to, to back up then to, to, you know, answer your question, I was in my early 30s uh, in my second marriage and um, I, I, I acted out and then got bored of that and quit. And then about a year later, my wife found out some of the secrets that I'd had and and she said, you know, you're not such a nice guy. You know, people think you're a nice guy, but, you know, you, you're passive aggressive and you hurt me and you need to go get help. And I'm thinking, I need to get help. You're the one who's angry all the time and moody all the time and never wants to have sex anymore. But she says, I'm leaving you if you don't go get help. And you're a sex addict. So, okay, we're not having any sex. How can I be a sex addict? So I actually went to a 12-step group for sex addicts. Quickly found out I was not a sex addict. I wasn't having enough sex and it wasn't impulsive. My acting out was more around um, seeking a validation than it was about actual sexual contact. So I landed in some really good places. One was that 12-step group because for the first time in my life, I started just opening up and being real, being transparent, sharing things about me, revealing what's called my, my toxic shame, things I never let people know about me. Because I, I grew up in a fundamental Christian church, an angry, critical father, codependent mother, trying to be different than my father, trying to be different than all the bad men I'd heard women complain about during the angry 60s and 70s. And so that was the first time I really started revealing me. And then, then I got into therapy for the first time and started learning about boundaries and started you know, learning about how to take better care of myself. And then I joined a men's group that I was in for about five or six years. That's where I did the bulk of the work on what became No More Mr. Nice Guy, because I began to realize this roadmap, this, this, this paradigm that I had, that if I'm just a nice guy, I'll be liked and loved and get my needs met. And, and I came to realize that my paradigm was, was faulty and flawed and based on an internalized perception that I wasn't good enough just as I was, that I wasn't lovable. So I have to become what I think other people want me to be and hide anything about me that might get a negative reaction from other people. 
So I, I, I had a private practice at that time in marriage and family therapy. And probably these guys were coming to me before, but I hadn't really noticed their stories in the way that I started noticing. But what I started noticing is they were saying the same thing I was. I'm a nice guy. I'm one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. I treat my wife, my girlfriend better than her ex. I'm raising her kids. I give her everything she wants, you know, but it's never good enough. When's it going to be my turn? How come she's angry all the time? How come she never wants to have sex anymore? I thought I'm not the only one thinking if I just do everything right, you know, go along to get along, not rock the boat, be kind and generous and giving that I'll get back what I want. So I started a no more Mr. Nice Guy men's group. We met every other week, quickly started another one. And I started writing, I guess, just chapters. Now we might call them blog articles. Just they were rough. I just, whatever I was discovering about me, uh, what I thought maybe the origins of nice guy syndrome were, uh, our, our, our internal belief systems about ourselves and the world, our behaviors that were ineffective, uh, how to be more effective in getting our needs and wants met. And out of those chapters, I was giving the guys every week, they and their wives and girlfriends are saying, Robert, you should write a book. A lot of people need this. It could be a bestseller. You should go on Oprah. I mean, no pressure there, right? Mm. So, you know, over a period of six or seven years, I wrote, I started kind of working the material, kind of rewrote it about three different times. After about six or seven years, finally got, got it into a, a the finished shape, the, the way it pretty much looks now. Um, and then spent about three more years trying to get it published. And even though I had an agent and a lot of publishers, big publishing companies, the editor said, Robert, we like your book, but our marketing department says men won't buy a self-help book. All right. Now, I see your books behind you on the shelf. Men buy books. Now, this was kind of in the beginnings of Amazon before, you know, and before podcasts, before guys could hear the name of a book, put it into Amazon, click that button. And people who bought this book bought this book, too. And we go click, 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 click. Now, we might not read all those books, but we buy them. Right. And, and so for a book that editors said, you know, Ben wouldn't buy, uh, my royalty checks keep getting bigger every year. And, and, you know, it's spreading in, in the books, you know, getting more and more prominence and visibility every year. And it's been out over 20 years now. So that's really uncommon for a, a, a self-help, uh, personal development kind of book. So men do buy self-help books. Men do want to be good men. They want to be their best selves. And so that's really how the book came about. It, it came from my ex-wife saying, you better go get help or I'm leaving you. And that's why we're talking today. Um, the title, did you get any pushback on the title? Because it could have been like in an era of Me Too, it might be challenging. Did you have, because it is a very clever title. The writer in me loves it. Yeah. Um, yeah the pushback? only pushback, the only pushback, this is kind of funny, is from my agent. My my agent, and he was a, a very, very uh, accomplished agent. He, did, he didn't need to take my book on, but he liked it. And uh, and he did. He, he'd had plenty of success, mostly in fiction before mm -hmm. me. Um, but he took it on because he liked it. And um, and he said, maybe we should change the name. And I said, non-negotiable. No more, no more Mr. Nice Guy. Not going to change the name. Because, you know, it, it does have that that kind of ironic or paradoxical, um, you know, vibe to it. You know, we've all said it. No more Mr. Nice Guy. I'm not taking it anymore. Well, you know, we've all said that. And, and that doesn't mean we're going to turn into instant assholes just because we declare no more Mr. Nice Guy. But on the on, on the other side of it, you know, you look and go, why would somebody write a book teaching men to be not nice? There's enough not nice men out there, right? Mm -hmm. So, believe it or not, my, the the publishers of it, Barnes and Noble, twenty something years ago, I think were were hoping that there would be some kind of blowback on yeah. that. There's never been any, none, and mm -hmm. and and it was funny. Um, about six years ago, I, I dropped by my agent's house in in New York City to pick up a $75,000 check for the audible version that, that I went back there to re-record. That was an advance they gave me. And he, he said, come by my house and get the check. I go, okay. And he goes, you know what? That was brilliant. The, you know, that name, no more Mr. Nice Guy. And, and I didn't, I didn't tell him, you know, Nat, you tried to talk me out of the name. <laughs> so, you know, I, one, one of my certified coaches just sent me a, a, a message just this morning. And he said, Robert, I just get so tired of all the haters and all, all, all the, you know, negative stuff on the Internet and social media. And, and he goes, what should I do? I just wrote back, get off the Internet. And, and, and so I, I'm, I'm not on social media. Uh, 
you know, I, I kind of know what's going on in the world, but, you know, I, I'm not out there, you know, listening to what people say. So if there's been blowback or pushback, I haven't heard about it. And I think if there was, I would have heard about it. Mm. I maybe in 20 something years have gotten maybe 20 pieces of hate mail. And, and mostly from people who's obviously they've not read the book. And often, and often more from men than women. And all about the only women that write me that, you know, kind of, you know, are kind of pissy about, about the book is almost always because their boyfriend or husband read the book and left them. And the email they write me is like this long, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going, run, run for us, run, <laughs> you know, get, get away from, you know. Yeah. So the blowback has not been anything about, you know, gender wars or anything like that, because the, the, the book is not at all anti-female. It's not teaching men to be assholes. It's teaching men to be integrated men, to integrate all aspects of themselves in a very visible, conscious way, kind of nothing hidden, nothing half-assed. Um, to live up to their full potential, to be honest, to be boundaried, to, uh, to it's, it's, it's nothing about, you know, that easy, oh, let's be a jerk and women like that. You know, yeah. There's nothing like that in there. It could be uh, an alternative type. It could be no more Mr. Needy guy, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't quite sound, uh, it doesn't have the, the it, you know, that punch. it's interesting because I, I actually, um, in, in, in my men's program, uh, Integration Nation, I just did a lesson this this last Thursday. We we got a call every Thursday where I, I give a lesson and we have some discussion on it, and and it's about needs, about getting our needs met. And and I and I I set the the lesson up around that idea of neediness, mm -hmm. and, and how for men and women, when a man, for example, is needy in approaching a woman, whether it's his partner or somebody he doesn't know, I say that neediness comes across as creepy, and and it is not that there's anything wrong with having needs. We're human, of course we have needs. But I said, our job is to take full responsibility and accountability for, number one, getting our own needs met and surrounding ourselves with people who want to help us get our needs met. And, and, and I think it was one of my coaches in, in you know, our online forum said, Robert, can't we basically say that nice guy syndrome is neediness? So exactly what you just said. Yeah, yeah it is, is, is unmet, unconscious needs which tends to lead men to operate from what I call covert contracts. Mm. And a lot of people, after they read No More Mr. Nice Guy, they say, Robert, that was a thing that just really hit me. And, and to me, I, I still use the concept in my life. And basically, nice guys, because we're not comfortable getting our needs met, we think we're bad for having needs. We think mm -hmm. we internalize all of this stuff as children, infants, you know, inaccurately and an emotional belief i'm bad for having needs or everybody else's needs have to get met before mine can get met or i'll be needless and wantless i i, I mean i try to be that way as well no 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 not me let me take care of you so but what happens then is we have needs and and because the nice guy's often hiding their needs and their wants and their sexuality because we're afraid we're going to get a negative response that makes us like this big empty hole it makes us needy so we use these three covert contracts First one is that if I'm a good guy, I'll be liked and loved. And, and often men, nice guys apply that to sexuality as well. Well, if I'm, if I'm a, if I'm a good guy to my wife or to this woman, I, you know, I listen to her talk about her problems. I paid her, you know, I paid her car payment. You know, I helped her move. She should want to have sex with me now. Which you know is very that would be a fundamental misunderstanding of sexual attraction, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> I call it nice guy seduction. It, yeah. it does not work. I tried it for many years, and you can get women. You yeah. can get women, but you get women who want to talk about their problems, who need yeah. help paying their car payment. You know, who, who are moody and angry. You will get those women with nice mm. guy seduction, and, and and they'll keep you around as long as you know you you are meeting their needs, but. So that covert contract, number one, if I'm a good guy, I'll be liked and loved. And the women I want to have sex with will have sex with me. Mm. Covert contract number two, and this is the one really around needs, that if I can read other people's minds and meet their needs without them having to ask, then they will read my mind and meet my needs without me having to ask. Totally manipulative, totally unconscious. The nice guy often doesn't even know he's got this covert contract. Otherwise, it's covert. It's hidden. It's unconscious. The other person, the other people, the world, God doesn't know we have this covert contract. That God, I did this, you know, how come you're not doing this for me? And, and again, it often plays out between us and women. Third covert contract is if I do everything right, 
then I will have a smooth, problem-free life. Now, real Peter Panish, everything should go well. If I do it right, it should go well. How come everything isn't going the way I want it to? Well, life doesn't. Life is chaotic by nature. But nice guys are operating by these really, really, I guess, immature, juvenile belief systems and roadmaps about the world. And it's one reason why we're not particularly nice why we get frustrated, why we get resentful, why we get passive aggressive, why we get controlling, why we get manipulative, why we can be hurtful, because we're not being conscious and upfront with ourselves and surely with nobody else. Um, the book is peppered with the concept of the recovering nice guy, right? Now, when we think of re re recovering, we think of addiction and, yeah. and trauma, right? Um, what are the addictive properties of nice guy syndrome? Is, is, well, it an, is it a kind of addiction? It, it, let, let me answer that in two ways, okay? I, I know some people react to, you know, that idea of recovery. And, well, you know, I'm, I'm not broken. No, we're not. Nice guy syndrome is not that, that we're broken or that there's anything fundamentally wrong with us. It comes out of a belief that maybe we're broken and there's something fundamentally wrong. And we layer all kinds of things on us that I call attachments. Well, if, I, if I'm good looking or if my car is clean, if I'm a good dad, if I make enough money, if I get good grades, if I excel, then, right, there's a covert contract. If I do those things, then I'll be liked and, and loved and get my needs met. So what we're recovering from is a mistaken belief that there's something wrong with us. Right. And what we're at in our recovery process, what we're doing is we're shedding, number one, things that don't serve us. We're shedding that roadmap and paradigm that won't take us where we want to go. It's like, you know, we've been given a roadmap of Los Angeles and, and we've been, you know, driving around in San Francisco thinking it should get us where we want to go or, you know, Dublin and we're driving around, you know, in London. It, it doesn't work, but we think it should. That's where a lot of our frustration comes from. I know this should work. So we're not recovering from some sense of brokenness or badness. And, and I say in No More Mr. Nice Guy, recovery from the nice guy syndrome and becoming what I call an integrated male is not about becoming a better person or a different person. It's about becoming more us, becoming all of who we are, embracing all of who we are. And especially those dark things about us that we don't let people see. We don't want to look at ourselves. Is integrating all of that into our persona. And kind of like, you know, like I said, a phrase I like to use, nothing hidden, nothing half-assed. You know, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do it in the open and I'm going to do it fully, right? No holding back. And by the way, that that is very attractive to, to the world. It's attractive to, to women, to the feminine, to money, opportunity, adventure. Nothing hidden, nothing half-assed. I, I, I started reading a novel last night called uh, Little Liar by Mitch Album, And and the book, the story is being told by Truth. There's a character called Truth. And he said, truth is very attractive on people. And I thought, yeah, that's what I teach. It's also okay. risky, Truth. Um, it's, it's, it's risky. It's, well, it's that's, I think that's what this book's about, mm. is that it is risky. That the, and, and, it, and being truth, telling the truth is even more than just not telling lies, right? Mm. Truth is just, again, nothing hidden nothing half-assed. Mm -hmm. So the rec recovery question and the addiction question. I began what, what I call my nice guy recovery. I'm a recovering nice guy. Now, do I think I'm broken and flawed? No, I, you know, I'm, I'm no more flawed than any other human being. You know, of course, none of us are perfect, but our flaws don't make us unlovable. Uh, but yeah, we, you know, we all fuck up. We all, we all, have errors. We all make mistakes. We all, I, I often say that I'm bumbling my way through life. You know, I, I got a PhD in marriage and family therapy at 29. I'm on my third marriage and I bumbled my way through all of them. Right. But that's okay. Really? Mm -hmm. That's okay. That's how we learn in life is, is stumbling. And well, why, why didn't that work? And then, you know, picking the pieces up and learning as we go. But in terms of the addiction aspect, because I began my recovery in a 12-step program, I, I was somewhat influenced by, by an addictive model. And in No More Mr. Nice Guy, I don't ever use the term codependency, but that's really what nice guy syndrome is. And that was a conscious decision when I wrote the book 25 years ago to not use the term because the only, at that time, the only places you really saw the term codependency 
was in addiction writing and therapy with the codependent being the partner of the identified addict. So whether it's the husband or the wife of, of the alcoholic, the drug addict, the gambling addict, whatever. And so they were, that's where the word codependent came from is they, they were co-dependent on that other person and even their, their addiction in order to have a sense of self and identity. I'll say more about that in a second. Mm -hmm. So, and the other, other way that codependency tended to be used culturally at that time was in general for women, because we kind of saw codependency as a female thing, because, you know, maybe 25, 30 years ago, we kind of had this image that, you know, women were nice and caring and caretaking and sacrificed themselves for husband and family. And, you know, maybe that was true. Uh, at one time. It, it doesn't seem to be all that true nowadays. Uh, I think we've flipped it, you know, whereas it's the guys are all out there, you know, being being nice and, and trying to, you know, being caring and giving. And it's the women that are going for it. You know, they've been taught, you know, go get the career, go get the promotion, go get that. So it, it's kind of flipped. But another term, and I really like this term, you don't hear it very much, but another term for codependency is the term borrowed function. And the reason why I like that is it's kind of easier to see in our, our behavior and our, our emotional patterns than the word codependent. If you think about it, ask people to define codependency. Are you going to get a definition out of that that actually looks like something you could actually apply to your life? But borrowed functioning. So for example, what if for me to have a sense of identity, a sense of value, a sense of purpose that I, I count? What if I need to be, ha I need, I need somebody that needs fixed. I need somebody that has issues that I can step in and help. So let's, let's say you and I get together and I say, oh man, you're, 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 you're struggling or you're sad, you're depressed, or you've got that addiction. Or, you know, I, you know, if I just helped you, you could really be amazing. You could really get your life together and everything would be good. And back behind that covert contract is you'll love me and appreciate me. And, and, and if this is a romantic interest, I think, and then I'm going to have that diamond in the rough that really gets polished up into something special that I don't think I could just get on my own right now. So my borrowed functioning is I need you to have problems. I need you to have struggles. I need you to have an addiction. I need you to have money problems. I need you to have an eating disorder. I need you to be borderline narcissistic. You know, all, all, We're talking about all the terms bantered around on social media nowadays. I need that for me to function. And I'm going to keep investing myself, giving to get. I'm going to I'm going to pay all this attention to you. I'm going to help you when you're down. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to try to fix you. But the truth is, I'm, I'm manipulative. I'm controlling of you. I, I have an unspoken agenda. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm giving to get. And the most, I don't like to use this word much, but the most toxic aspect of that borrowed functioning is I need you to stay fucked up mm -hmm. so I keep having a job to do. Because if you start getting strong and healthy and independent and you don't need me, I don't know who I am. I don't know what my role is. I don't know why you'd want to be with me. I don't know what my value is. Now, often that's wrong. Often these people we've been with still love us and want to be with us. They just don't need us to fix them, right? And maybe they didn't in the first place. So that's the borrowed functioning of codependency. So when you ask, is there an addiction? Codependency in, in many circles, not all, is considered an addiction. Okay. And, and it's like it's it creates the same altered states that other addictive substances and behaviors might create. There, there's still debate out there. Some people claim the only true addict addictions are substances that alter chemistry. But they found that behaviors alter chemistry. Gambling, you know, pulling that, that you don't pull the lever anymore. You push the button on, on the machine. Gambling alters it. Codependency all alters chemistry. So that in terms of an addictive process, what we're recovering from is that need to have something to fix outside of us to get a sense of self or identity. And because if we start shedding that, just like an addict shedding their alcohol, their drugs, their gambling, you know, their food, whatever. Once we shed that, we don't know who we are. We're, we're, we're in an existential crisis. Who am I? What do I do? What value do I have? I, I don't even know why to get up in the morning. So that's a, an, an, an addiction model way of looking at nice guys. Saying. When you're working with, um, and it's predominantly men, obviously, that you would work with um, post-marriage and, and family therapy stuff, um, 
you would probably be talking about childhood in some capacity. You would probably be talking about maternal and paternal influences in your own life. I'm, I'm wondering, the, the, the ministry is a kind of a performance role. Um, and you might, I might, looking in from the outside in, I might say, okay, well, there's a little bit of deception involved in ministry. A little bit, maybe, sometimes. You know, when, when, when I'm thinking of, you know, the... So, what we no, see come on, the, you can break it. I'm not a minister anymore. You can say whatever you want to say. Yeah, I, 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 it's, it just seems like a natural path and role for somebody that was, that did go through that nice guy stuff to and end up I, in. I have no doubt that, that many people go to the ministry out, out of a, a codependent mindset. I mean, think about this. When I got to, to college, and, and I went to college to study to be a minister, my first, my freshman year of college, I, I took psychology 101. I thought, I, I love this stuff. I mean, this this is amazing. So I I, I, I went down a path that involved both psychology counseling and, and, and ministry. And I was a minister for eight years. And I have two degrees in religion and my doctorate's in marriage and family therapy. But I, I you know, I realized probably pretty early on, I think even while still in college before I ever got to grad school, that I was going down both those paths, ministry and psychology, to repair my family, to, to fix my family, my mother, my father. I mean, they, they were together until my father died about 12, 13 years ago. Uh, my mother's still alive. You know, it was, you know, it was, it was a perfect codependent storm. My father being angry and moody and needy, my mother being codependent and seeking value and trying to keep everything calm and teaching me to be the same way. And, and so... I know I was probably going to fix them. And probably a lot of people that go into ministry or go into counseling probably are working on unresolved, unidentified family of origin issues. I, I have no doubt I was. And, and maybe think about it. Two career paths that I've had, ministry and counseling, you think there might be a little bit of giving to get, a little bit of I'm going to help other people and get value and identity from that. Yeah, th there's no doubt about that. And a lot of counselors and probably a lot of ministers that's probably true. And I know I didn't become a decent therapist until I went and did my own work, until I started getting, until I quit getting my sense of value out of, you know, how I helped other people. Now, of course, I still love it. I so Some guy just wrote me a note today in, in, in my men's program, and he said, Robert, I just wanted to express appreciation to you because that's a new skill I want to work on. And he said, I just really appreciate everything you've done, your book, and in this program that you've de developed. And I wrote back and said, of course, I love hearing that. And, and I do. I like knowing what I do makes a difference in the world. Um, and yes, it makes it easier to do knowing it's well-received. You know, if everything mm -hmm. I did got me nailed to a cross one way or another, yeah, I, I might think, you know, I should rethink, you know, this path that I'm on. So thankfully, it does in general get positive responses. I've learned to develop a thick enough skin to the negative responses. I have what I call a jack wagon folder that I put those emails and messages in when, you know, it's just attacking for the sake of attacking. What are, what are the but, negatives? Well, why would... Why would they be? I've, I've read Now Mr. Nice Guy numbers. I can't imagine why, where the negativity would come from. It, it has nothing to do with, with that. It just, we live in a world where anybody can say anything they mm. want on any platform with no consequence. Impunity. No consequence. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, anybody can, you know, um, whether it's the whole hashtag Me Too thing, anybody could have accused anybody of anything. And there's no way that that person going would might even know they'd been accused or, you know, unless they were a celebrity or even, you know, defend themselves or even say, wait a minute, I don't even know that person. Or, you know, that's actually not what happened. But in social media is like that. You and I were talking just before we started recording that, you know, nowadays, you know, every woman that breaks up, you know, with an ex, he was either a sociopath or a narcissist. And every guy that breaks up with an ex, she was a borderline. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and we just post that stuff mm -hmm. like like we know what we're talking about. You know, in all my 30 plus years as a therapist, I maybe have met less than a half a dozen true narcissists. But now, you know, everybody's ex is a narcissist. So eh, I think we're kind of but but that's that's the Internet. So. If I even, you know, publish a book that in some ways is is empowering to men, and even that's a scary word nowadays, empowerment, that's empowering yeah. to men, 
there's going to be people, both men and women. Uh, there's a, a, a guy wrote an article in um, uh, a Canadian newspaper, it came out about a year ago, um, that lumped my book and half a dozen other books for men all together and basically just ripped us all apart that, you know, we were teaching men to be misogynistic and patriarchal. And, and only one of the books on that whole list maybe even leaned in that direction. And, you know, it included like Robert Bly's Iron John, mm. you know, just several books. I'm, I'm, I, I was actually kind of proud to be categorized in all of those books that he picked. But mm. it's kind of like he just, you know, just because they were about masculine empowerment and he just ripped them all. As, and and it went on in this article to say it's been proven children don't need a father in the household that does more damage. I mean, where do you get that evidence? There's actually more evidence that mothers are more psychologically damaged. Well, obviously, he's never heard fathers. of Warren Farrell, Doctor Warren <laughs> Farrell, like you know. Yeah, you know, and and you know, I, I love Warren. The boy crisis. Like, and, and yeah, and, he 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 wrote a nice little blurb for No More Mister Nice Guy back mm. before anybody would ever heard of me. So, mm. so. To come back to your question, why are people negative? Because people like to be negative. It feels good to be negative. And I've got, you know, a platform where I can be negative, whether it's giving book reviews on Amazon or just sending an email or a message off to the person that, you know, I think's full of shit uh, or just putting it on social media. And, and you know, that's what people enjoy. You know, we we, we like that better than, than good news. And, and again, yeah. it's kind of why I tend to stay off social media and, and the internet in general. I just... I just don't need that noise, yeah. but it is, it is out there and you're going to attract it. You know what? Um, I, I'm not religious. I don't know if you can see this, but I got, I got a crucifix tattooed on my arm, you know, and I'm, and I'm not at all religious anymore. And I got that 15 plus years ago. And I, and I didn't know why at the time. Actually, after my second divorce, I, I started running into, and I decided to start collecting crucifix art. I'd never been Catholic. Now I didn't know what it meant, but every, every, you know, used furniture store I went to looking for, pieces to put in my apartment i found crucifix art i go well, okay it's there i guess i better start collecting it and and what it really came down to i think psychologically was a message to myself from my unconscious stop if persecuting you take, yourself it, it, well it's even more than that if you take a stand if you live up to your full potential if you make a little noise in the world you're going to get nailed to a few crosses mm -hmm. It comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, you know, looking at those books right behind you on the shelf, both of those people have been nailed to a few crosses for, for speaking their truth. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just is gonna happen. So the truth is, I've learned you gotta develop somewhat of a tough skin and just know it's just noise. It's just mm -hmm. noise. And um, you know, we can buy into it or we can say, okay, that, that's just they're just making noise. But it does happen. Um, I wanted to ask you about the women. Women are repelled by nice guys. Is that fair to say? You know, I, I can say that as a generalization because no, they're not necessarily. Um, a lot of women like having nice guys around them. And, and the men's side of the story is, oh, I, they put me in the friend zone. I always end up in the friend zone. So mm. apparently... There's enough women out there who like having nice guys around them that we actually have a category, right, of of for those women and the men who are trying to please them. You know, mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're friends. Uh, they're, they're, they're putting the friends on. And so, yeah, there's a lot of women that, that like having guys around that will listen to them talk about their problems, that, that they can call up at two in the morning and complain about their ex who's being a jerk who will help them make a car payment, who will, you know, let them be moody and go off on them and keep coming back for more. There's plenty of women that that do like that. You know, for example, I, I used to think that if a woman wanted to tell me her problems, that meant she valued me. That meant I, I had an in if she wanted, because that began with my mother. You know, my, my mother began telling me her problems, especially in regard to my father at a very young age. So I thought that meant, oh, I'm special. And it took me years, I mean, many years to realize, oh, women will talk to anybody who will listen. They'll talk to their girlfriends. They'll talk to their gay friends. They'll talk to their, you know, not gay, but, you know, guy friends who want to be. They'll talk to their cat. They'll talk to the checkout, you know, person. They'll talk to anybody who will listen. And I'm going, that doesn't make me special. So, yes, there are plenty of women who are happy to have guys around that will pay their car payment, listen to them talk about their problems. 
And I'm not saying that's all women, but there's there are those women out there that, that, that will do that. Going back to, to that, that repulsive part and the needy part, that really is a piece there. And, and I write in No More Mr. Nice Guy because this, this is something I discovered in, in my own relationship with my second wife when we were married. And that's why I was married to when I wrote the book. So a lot of my stories kind of relate to that part of my life. But one of the patterns in, in our relationship was this dynamic that our relationship began as an affair. So we were both married when we met. So it was really hot and heavy sexually. On our honeymoon, she announced, aren't you glad that now we're married? We don't have to pretend to like sex anymore. And I'm going, I wasn't pretending. I remember you, know, you saying this, like this is, I, 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 this is like a, the most extraordinary, you were in a tent, I think you said. We was, were camping, we yeah. were camping. And she'd been reading women who love too much, our whole honeymoon. We're driving around the mountains and she's reading women who love too much. She goes, oh, do you think this is me? Do you think this is me? Kind of like, you know, she's the codependent one putting up with me. So, so we're Talk camping and she says it's yeah. timing on our honeymoon. Yeah. And, and, but I was such a nice guy. You know, I go, oh, I know that happened in your last marriage that as soon as you married your husband, you didn't want to have sex anymore. And I thought, but I'm different. You know, that's a nice guy thing. I can fix this. I can make it better. And again, that's that borrowed functioning thing. There's a problem to be fixed that I can fix. It never got better, but it was probably just what I needed because it really forced me to confront my nice guy dynamics. I mean, again, I'm so grateful for my 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 second wife because we're talking today. I, I mean, I wrote a book because what I was forced to deal with because of, of our dynamics. But one of the pieces, a big one, was around sex. And, you know, she she was constantly, you know, like that around sex. And so I kept trying to like, you know, sneak my, my sexual agenda up on her. You know, I'd rub, rub her back. I, I do this. I try to, you know, get her in the mood. I might, you know, see, try to touch the side of her breast. Did I get a negative reaction from that? You know, it, it was creepy. It was mm. creepy. You know, it was so indirect, so passive. And she's sitting there probably lying there. I know what he's going to do next. He rubbed my back. Now he's going to move his arm around. Now his hand's going to try to touch the side of my breast. Now he's going to do this because I've done it so many times. You know, that's terrible foreplay. But, you know, it, I, I kept, you know, sneaking that, that that agenda up on her. And nice guys do that with women they like. I go back to that Colbert contract. I'll listen to you talk about your problems. I'll carry your books for you. I'll be a nice guy. I'll do this. Then maybe I'm hiding my sexual agenda from you. I'm going to sneak it up on you. And this is the craziness of nice guy thinking. If I hide my sexual agenda from you, maybe you'll want to get naked with me. Now, you can scratch your head for that one for a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. There's no fucking logic to it, but nice guys still do it, okay? So, but here's what happens. I, I say in No More Mr. Nice Guy that typically when a woman rejects a man sexually, often she's not rejecting him sexually. She's rejecting the needy way he's approaching her with a sexual agenda. And I refer to it as a big emotional hose that we want to go and hook that emotional hose because often it has almost nothing to do with sex and everything to do with validation. You know, approve of me, like me, think I'm okay. And, 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 and you'll do these things by desiring me sexually, by wanting to have sex with me. That's why I said earlier, my sexual acting out that led I mean, beginning my nice guy recovery on the surface looked like, oh, that's a, a sexual acting out. It really had almost nothing to do with, with sex. It had everything to do with approval seeking and validation. So that was coming out, even then was coming out of a needy place. And, you know, some women may respond to that initially, but, you know, once they kind of get that feel of this is pure neediness coming from the guy, it, that's the repulsive part. That's what they tend to push away. Because when, when I talk about masculine and feminine energies, I, I mm -hmm. talk about the masculine doing and the feminine being done too. And, and we all have a masculine and feminine side to us. Men do, women do. The feminine side of us is receptive. I, I often say the feminine in us and in women is a big empty bucket with a hole in the bottom that needs to be filled from the outside. So if the feminine is this empty bucket with a hole in the bottom that needs to be filled from the outside, and a guy is approaching a feminine creature, basically saying, fill me, fill me, love me, want me, desire me, that big empty bucket's going, hell no, get the fuck away from me. You know, that just feels like something I have to do, not something that's going to benefit me. 
And this happens in marriages. It happens with single guys. And then the guy thinks, what's wrong with me? Women don't want me sexually. And, and because they've confused their emotional neediness, their own emptiness, their own empty bucket for sexual rejection. But they're, they're completely separate things. It's just so many men wrap sexual validation around their inner emptiness and neediness, approach the feminine with this, you know, sexual, you know, love me, want me, you know, do me. But underneath that is, I just need you to make me feel like I'm, a, I'm an okay person. It's just so many men wrap sexual validation around their inner emptiness and neediness, approach the feminine with this, you know, sexual, you know, love me, want me, you know, do me. But underneath that is, I just need you to make me feel like I'm, a, I'm an okay person. Mm -hmm. And and most women, if they have any sense of, you know, the of vibrational energy states, they're, that's going to feel bad. It's going to feel creepy to them, even if they don't know why. Uh, going back to the 10th, when, when you told that, when you mentioned that before, I was wondering, why did she assume Robert wouldn't want to have sex? Like she said, why, why uh, isn't it great now we, we both can pretend we don't want to have sex? Why would she assume you as well? Like what was leading up to that moment? Like I was, <laughs> it, was it was one of the most extraordinary um ideas and it was like a mind it's like a jaw dropping moment and i've never been married right and okay. i was reading that i was thinking okay I, what, what, would I'm you think that my partner has certain expectations around this you know <laughs> it it was perfect right you know w without going into analysis of my ex and believe me i've spent some time trying to analyze <laughs> my ex you know 14 years of marriage and we've been divorced i think for over 22 years now 20 plus years and and occasionally I'll still revisit, you know, not much anymore, but the analysis of what made her tick. I, I don't know. There's a lot of things I still don't know. Still don't know, right? And um, but it, it was the perfect storm that was perfect for me. You know, if you think about it, you know, what what normal self-respecting guy would would even continue the rest of that honeymoon? He'd sit up and have a discussion and say, wait a minute, we need to talk. What do you mean by that? You know, of course, my expectation is now that we're married, we'll have more sex and we don't have to hide it anymore or be secretive or have it be filled with shame. You know, I, th I think a self-respecting person would have said, let's have a conversation about this. And if that conversation didn't show some promise of it could lead to a resolution, mm -hmm. you'd go, we need to end this now. This isn't, but that's not what a nice guy did. <laughs> that's, that's not what I did. I thought... I can fix this, right? It was just perfect for me. It laid out the perfect, you know, task that I could undertake, right? To, to fix that thing. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you would think any rational partner, when they commit to a monogamous relationship, you would think that it would imply that monogamy implies availability, right? And I've been saying that for a while because you can't say to somebody, like, you can only talk to me but I'm not going to talk to you. You, know, you can only have sex with me, but I'm not going to have mm -hmm. sex with you. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that's not rational and nobody would agree to that. But in that case, I was a nice guy. So I took it on. So I, I don't blame her for that. She was just living out whatever her own woundings and relationship dynamic. And, and, you know, that, 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 that was about her. The, the, the more interesting question is why would any guy run with that for the next 14 years? But again, I'm so grateful. It, you know, those kind of things were the big stick. They were the wake up call. They got my attention. It took time. Mm -hmm. and it took a lot of a lot of messiness, um, but it got me to where I am today. So I'm I'm so grateful. That's again, I like to use the word big stick. That was a big stick that got my attention. Mm -hmm. That that became problematic for me. Problematic enough that it got me into some great places where I could start learning about me and start becoming self aware. I think what you've outlined very um, descriptively what it takes to be a nice, anybody watching this will recognize themselves who has symptoms, nice guy symptoms, right? When they do, what's the next step they should take? How do they? Well, go go buy no more Mr. Nice Guy, of course. Obviously. That's where you start. <laughs> yeah, that's where you start. Okay. Then what? <laughs> okay. What are the steps out of this? Usually, you know, when I'm asked this question, I, I kind of just walk people through the steps that I took without really knowing those were the steps that mm -hmm. you take. 
they seem to to have worked out in a, in a pretty good succession. So in No More Mr. Nice Guy, one of the first things I say, one of the earliest things I say in the book is don't try to do this alone. Most men, and especially most nice guys, want to just figure this stuff out in our own head. You know, nowadays, you know, talk about addiction. I think a great majority of men are information addicts. You know, we, we read self-help books. We watch and listen to podcasts. We're on YouTube. You know, we're gathering information all the time. And one of the things I tell most men, I said, you probably already have gathered enough information to significantly change your life if you put it into action. Mm -hmm. Is there more good stuff out there? Yeah, of course there is. But at some point, you know, we, we got to put it into action. But most most men, especially nice guys, just want to keep gathering information. Oh, I'll, I'll read the book by myself. I'll watch YouTube videos. I'll watch interviews. That doesn't recover anything. So I tell guys, you did not become a nice guy in social isolation. You won't recover. You won't break free from nice guy syndrome in social isolation. And a very primary reason is, one of the core foundations of nice guy syndrome that I talk about in No More Mr. Nice Guy is toxic shame. We've mentioned that briefly. And I, I think the two core pieces that, that, that create nice guy syndrome are anxiety and shame. And most of my nice guys are trying to manage both of those things. So if you have toxic shame, you inaccurately internalized belief system, I'm not okay just as I, just as I am, you're not going to get rid of that. You're not going to exercise that by your own thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Even journal writing, you know, even self-talk, even affirmations won't change that. You have to get with safe people. So that's number one. Get with safe people, a coach, a therapist, a men's group, a 12-step group, maybe a minister or a rabbi, somebody who is safe and you can start revealing everything about you you don't want to reveal. And in those safe environments, and I love men's groups because, you know, one man will start being vulnerable, opening up and revealing. I always get a kick out of it. Like a guy, you know, maybe a session or two into a group, maybe a few weeks, whatever, whether it's a workshop or a group, a guy will say, you know, I, I just got, I got to share this. I, I, I struggle with pornography. You know, and it's so hard for him to open up and say that. And then he talks about it, his shame about it, the compulsive behavior of it, you know, how his, his wife keeps catching him or he keeps swearing it off. And, you know, he's just, just sparing his soul. And now here's like six, eight other guys who've never made a peep about having those kind of hidden behaviors going, yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. And all of a sudden we're finding out I'm not bad. I'm not evil. I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. I just have a habit that doesn't serve me, but I'm not a bad person. But as long as we keep it in, that toxic shame just eats us up and keeps us hidden and keeps us small and frightened and fearful and not wanting to let people really see it. So it begins with finding safe people, revealing your toxic shame, getting more appropriate affirmative feedback that, no, you're not bad. You know, let's just let's just go to work on that. You know, you're, you're not evil. And let's just bring it out in the open. It, it, it That begins to suck the shame out of it. And, and the behaviors get easier to deal with if they're not bound up in shame. So safe people. Nice guys need to start learning to be honest. We, you know, most nice guys think they're pretty honest. I did. The truth is we lie about everything. You know, we leave out little tidbits of information. We, we misdirect people's attention. We just don't tell that part of the story. We might out and out lie, you know. We got to start being honest. And again, you need safe people to do that. Uh, it, be, it can be kind of scary to start doing that with the people closest to you. Say, I've been lying to you all along. Um, so start with safe people. Begin sharing how you are less than honest and trustworthy and truthful. And my definition of the truth is the whole truth, nothing but the truth, everything but the truth. When Again, when I was married to my second wife, when I started being honest, I started telling her, listen, I was going to lie to you. Here's the story I was making up. The lie is going to tell you. Here's why I was going to lie to you. And here's the truth. And what was funny, you know, she could detect my lies and would always react to them. She accused me of lying mid sentence. And I go, how does she know I'm lying? Luckily, she's wrong about what I'm lying about. So I can deny, you know, what she thinks. I'm plausible doing. deniability. But yeah, I got plausible deniability. No, she's <laughs> wrong. It's not that. It's not that. Uh, but it's this. You, you haven't guessed right yet. But 
she knew it. But when I started telling her, I was going to lie to you. Here's the lie I was going to tell you. Why I was going to lie to you. Here's the truth. She never got mad about that. She says, okay, thanks for telling me the truth. Oh, I'm going, is that easy? How come nobody told me that a long time ago? So learning to be honest. We have to learn to set boundaries. I started with a therapist and I was in my mid-30s, already had my doctorate degree, was in my second marriage. I'd never heard of boundaries before, but they're essential for, for a healthy, successful life and they're essential for any kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. Boundaries, we have to learn to set boundaries. Learning self-care. Nice guys, like I said, those covert contracts, we'll take care of everybody else, but not ourselves. When, when I was in my nice guy recovery, working with the therapist, I went on a one-year moratorium from giving anything to anybody. If I had the impulse to give, I'll buy that for my wife, or I'll get her those flowers, or I'll get her this card, or I'll, I'll get this surprise. Other than my children, any other surprises or giving, if I had the impulse to give, I had to stop, pause, and then ask myself, what do I need to give me? And I have to give myself something and then also go out myself to my wife about that as well. I was going to give you this. And in return, I, and, and luckily she was supportive of that process because she didn't like those covert contracts either. She, she told me all the time, you're really difficult to give to. I try to give you something, then you always like, give me something right back. So it never feels like I, I can really give to you. So I had to work on giving to me and accepting what people gave to me as well. You have to learn to start soothing yourself, soothing your anxiety, learning how to ground yourself, learning how to breathe, learning how to respond rather than react to, to reflexive situations that are wired into our nervous system. And finally, I say to guys, go get around men. Go create a posse, a community of men. Most nice guys are pretty isolated, don't have a lot of guy friends, will often say, I'm just more comfortable being around women. Well, you know, because we go get that affirmation from women. But I've been saying for a while that the masculine is love. The masculine is a source of love because masculine does. Masculine is intention and action. And if you take Scott Peck's from The Road Less Travel, his definition of love, it's intention and action to act in one's own or another's best interest. The feminine is, is, is the, the seeker of love, the consumer of love. So we're going to women trying to get love and as one of one of my coaches who wrote a book, I love this book called Sipping Fear, Pissing Confidence. And, it, and it's about breaking out of addictive cycles. But he says when a man, a man reaches maturity, when he quits seeking love from women. And he said, now he's reversed the flow. I love that. We don't grow up until we quit seeking to turn every woman into our mommy and get her to love us. When we can love ourselves and get the masculine love from other men, that's what fills us up. Now we're overflowing. Talk about what's attractive to women versus what creeps them out. A man who is full and overflowing, who's well-nourished and well-nurtured, again, confident in his own skin, purposeful, knows where he's going and having, looks like he's having a good time going there. That's highly attractive to the feminine. And I don't think a man really gets that till he gets a depth of connection with the masculine, with other men and with his own masculine. And speaking of connection, I wrote down a line um, from the book um, where you say nice guys tend to be disconnected from other men. Um, what would be the um, reason for that, Robert? Do you think it's a modern society thing or do you think that's it just it's been, it's been going on for 50, 100 years or you think that's something new, this disconnection between men? Oh, it's, it's, I think it's relatively new. You know, I, I talk about some of what I think are the, the social backgrounds of that in No More mm -hmm. Mr. Nice Guy. But just, you know, very nutshell, you know, short version. If you go back 100 years, you don't have to go back really any longer than that, to, to more of an agrarian society when people live more on farms, more outside of cities, and we weren't very industrialized. We, we had um, extended families. And boys grew up around their fathers. Their fathers were around because they were working. They are on the farm. Um, they grew up often around their grandfather maybe uncles maybe cousins and brothers they were around men and they didn't spend much time around women you go back a, you know a few thousand years to when we were tribal and and we're talking about about a million and a half years of human existence we were tribal and typically in tribes there were tribes within the tribe 
There was the, the women and children and older people that kind of huddled together. And then the men who went out and hunted and gathered and made war and did all the things and brought, you know, the furs and the food back and fucked and then got up and did it again. Men did not spend that much time around women. Now, I, I know we're not going to reverse our culture to where I tell men, don't spend time around women anymore. But what I can say is try to balance that out by getting more guy time in there, getting more time with men. Now, that can just be having a poker night with the guys. It can be going on a hike with the guys. It can be having a beer and watching a football game with the guys. It can be in a men's group where we maybe get more real or more vulnerable, more conscious. But we need that masculine energy to, to validate our own masculine self. And, and to kind of put a, a final piece on your question, what happened, I found, when I started working with guys, most were around my age. I'm, I'm kind of tail end of what's called the baby boom. And, and then, you know, like the genera Generation X came after us. Most men in that category will, will identify their fathers maybe weren't there, maybe a divorce in the family. Or if dad was there, he worked a lot. Or if dad was there, he wasn't safe. He was angry or ad addictive or, or critical. A lot of men, older men, I'll put myself in the category, um, report that kind of dynamic with their father. So many of us did not feel safe around a masculine figure. Maybe some of us have abuse issues from teachers, priests, coaches, whatever, you know, it's just, whether it's physical abuse, abuse, sexual abuse, emotional. So we didn't feel safe with men. Maybe we got bullied, right? So that can make us not feel comfortable with men. So we kind of seek out the, the feminine, you know, what we think is going to be nurturing. Actually, they're just taking, they're not nurturing. And, and and so that's the direction we go. And what I see now for a lot of young men, you know, the, the guys, I don't know what, what, what generation are we down to? Are they, they Y or, or where are we at? With the Gen Z or I think they're 18 to 25. Then there's uh, gen, millennials. The bottom of the millennial, but even millennials, my, my son is, is 38. And so a lot of guys in his age and down. Gen X, they, that's me. Yeah. yeah. When they talk about their fathers, a lot of them say, my dad was a nice guy, which is true because my son grew up with a nice guy father. And what a lot of these guys, will, young men will say, my father was a nice guy. And all he taught me about being a man was don't piss off your mother. Yeah. Because he was walking around on eggshells, not trying to piss off the boy's mother. So that shifted. But, but still, even though a lot of these younger men don't hate their father and don't, you know, think he's evil or bad. There still was no no safe, strong influence to initiate them into the scary world of the masculine. Now, somebody asked me the other day uh, on, on an interview, why, why are men seeking so much seeking female approval? And I go, actually, it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, it's not rocket science. If you think about it, we're born and, and our first caregiver is almost always female a mother or some other female caregiver, you know, might even go to daycare and it's females. We get in. And so we have to learn to please mom. We have to learn to please a woman to, to, to get our needs met, to survive. We go to school. Most of, most of the teachers are women. So now to get from second to third grade, besides just learning to read and write and do our arithmetic, we got to learn to please a woman. It makes sense that the boys and, and many men grew up learning to please women. How do I make the woman happy? How do I avoid pissing off the woman? How do I make sure I get what I need from a woman? And usually our strategy for doing it is way is way distorted. It doesn't, it doesn't work, but we're just doing our best. The problem is, the difference is, is that now for a hundred plus, a hundred years or so, young boys are not taken by the men of the tribe, the men of the community, and brought into the scary world. There's, the no There's, There's no initiation. There's no initiation. Yeah. And, and a masculine initiation served a few purposes. One, to teach us the skills we need to be an adult male, whether that, that be hunting or, or farming or, you know, fixing a car. You know, whatever. Nobody fixes cars anymore, I don't think. <laughs> You know, but we didn't, you know, you learn the, the skills you, you need to survive in the world. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of men out there with no life skills, right? Another thing that it does, it teaches us to be comfortable feeling uncomfortable. And again, most men nowadays are not comfortable feeling uncomfortable. We're, we're on our phones doom scrolling. We're playing video games. We're smoking dope. We're surfing the internet. We're jerking off to porn nonstop because none of those things are challenging. 
We're living in the nursery in that comfort, constantly seeking comfort. That doesn't bring out the best in us. It doesn't make us happy. So we have to have training to get comfortable feeling uncomfortable. And that comes from masculine initiation. But maybe one more thing that masculine initiation did for boys is it took them away from the women. It took them out of that place where in that nursery, they got constant attention from women and constant validation, hopefully. And now, you know, in, in more tribal societies, when we go back in time, you know, around 12 years old when the boy could work, when he could hunt, when he could fight, when he could, when the men needed him, he was taken away from the women and went and was with men and did the men things. And then from there on out, spent very little time around women. You know, this whole thing of, you know, a guy and a, a woman, you know, okay, we're in love. Let's move in together. Let's spend hours and hours together. All That's new in the human race. We've not been doing that for very long. And, and, and it's one of the reasons I think men keep retreating into these other, you know, uh, nursery type behaviors is because we're just, we're around women too much. So we got to have that connection with men. And again, this is not saying anything negative about women. It's just saying what men need in order to relate to women better. When, when I was a marriage and family therapist, couple walks in my office, very first session, I would tell them both, the best thing you guys can do for your marriage is both of you have good same-sex friends. You don't need to be each other's best friend. That's a mythology out of pop songs and you know Hollywood movies. We don't need to be each other's best friends. My wife, I love her dearly. She is not my best friend. She is not who I go to when I'm struggling with something. I got plenty of men who know me well, and I take it to them first, and then I give her the guy version of, of what's going on with me because she does need to know. But she doesn't need to be there, and I just you know sort it all out with her. I do that with guys. And you don't want her to feel unsafe either. If you if you expose yourself as being very vulnerable or there's a very serious problem, would you be concerned? Maybe you're exposing yourself too much, and maybe she might get feeling uns unsafe that you you don't have this under control. Well, let me give you an example. You know, for for some reason, the last few days I I felt kind of down. Uh, I, I was up. I live in Puerto Vallarta. I was in Seattle last week with my wife visiting my mom. And I, and I was pretty lethargic while I was up there. I blame it on the weather. There's a reason I left Seattle. Uh, it's, it's probably a lot moved like to, you moved know, to Ireland, the UK, Ireland. Ireland. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I know, I know you can relate what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. And, and so I moved to, you know, sunny Puerto Vallarta. But yeah, I enjoyed being up there for a week. But I was, I was pretty lethargic. And I, and I got back here Sunday, got off the airplane, came home, and, and went, laid down and took like a three hour nap. Got up, ate, went back to bed. I slept 12 hours that night. Monday, I was exhausted, allergies, itchy eye. And just today's now Thursday. And I'm just beginning to kind of feel like I'm, my energy is coming back. Now, I don't know, you know what, what had me down. Part of it could be emotional. Um, part of it could be physical. I, I haven't sorted it all out. But, but I seem to be on an upward curve. But my wife and I were walking the dog this morning. The last two couple mornings, I'm always up 7 a.m. or earlier. And, you know, I've been getting up at 8, 830. And so it's the first day I've walked the dog with my wife in a couple of days because she's just gone out and did it by herself because I'm so tired. I couldn't get up. And we're walking. I says, you know, I, I don't know why, but, you know, I think I'm just feeling a little depressed. You know, I'm just low energy. And I said, I don't know why. And, you know, it's good information for her to have. But as soon as I said it, I even thought this might make her anxious. Now, my wife is a tough cookie, right? She grew up eight out of 10 kids in poverty, Guadalajara, Mexico, alcoholic father, being beat on by her siblings, beat on by her neighbors, abused by her. She's tough. She goes to the gym two hours a day. She's a gym rat. She's done Mai Tai. She's done kickboxing. I mean, I don't fuck with her. I mean, she's tough. She can get anything done. But I also know she's feminine. And all of a sudden, her provider protector, you know, saying, I don't know what's up. I'm a little depressed. And so um, I, 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 we got back from walking the dog. I came in, did a little meditation, wrote in my journal and walked out. And here's two plates, a plate of fresh pineapple and a plate of fresh papaya. And she's about to go out breakfast with some friends. And she goes, I, I cut up some fruit for you. And I said, thank you. You know, that, 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 that feels really good. So I had a call I had to get on, got a little work done. And then I, I realized at a break, 
today. I got a bunch of more calls today, my time. I thought I, I have just enough time to go put the video in of Funk Roberts, my, my workout, you know, coach on online. And, and I sent her a message. She's out with her girlfriends. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get my workout in, get my sweat on. Cause I haven't worked out probably in a week and a half, which could be part of why I'm not feeling so good. And, and she gets back and, and, you know, she comes up, I'm in the shower and she goes, are, are you feeling better? A little less depressed? Maybe the workout helped. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's a, yeah. that's her therapy. Get to the gym. And, and I go, actually, it was the cut fruit you made for me that brought me out of my depression. And, and, and you know, so, you know, we transitioned that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if I stayed in that depressive state mm -hmm. and didn't have other, if I wasn't talking to my guy friends, if I wasn't getting in into the gym, if I wasn't working at getting back into my healthy routines, she would have a lot of reason to be concerned about that and to feel insecure. I'm, I'm unsafe. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about dating and essentials. You, you have some incredible, brilliant advice. Um, there's lots of stuff. And you, I think you've read, but, but didn't you write a book, Dating Essentials for Men? I've written two books called Dating Essentials for Men. Go figure. One of them is Dating Essentials for Men. The other is Dating Essentials for Men, Frequently Asked Questions, which, believe it or not, is one of my favorite books. I is is taken from when I taught dating essentials as an online course. Mm. It's taken from the online forum mm. where guys could ask me questions and I'd type them answers back. We took all the best, like a, a hundred categories, 300 questions, just the best questions. I polished them up, put them in a book. And, and I like it because I'm kind of like I am like on, 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 you know, this on a podcast interview. I'm just, I'm just direct. I just say what, you know, what I feel not trying to write a book that, you know, it's not going to piss anybody off kind of thing. It's like to the point. So yeah, two books, two dating essentials for men books. Um, an article from Psychology Today quoting Pew Research in 2023. I want to get your reaction to this. Indicated that 60% of men in the United States under 30 were single. Yeah. Double the number of women. And it's at a 30-year low. Now, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, nearly 47% of the total U.S. population, just over 170, 117 million people are currently single. And in the same article, it in indicated that between 76 and 87% of 18 to 29-year-olds in the United States, uh, U.K. and Australia are consuming pornography regularly. Yeah. Right. So there's Scary three stuff. things I'm throwing at you there, okay? Um what would you like to grapple with first? Well, I actually, I wrote a blog article uh, about, you know, some of these statistics and you, you know, send me that link. Cause those are really, really good specific statistics. So in general, let me kind of just put this in general terms. A couple of years back, you know, the first time, and, and the, what I saw was U S statistics that for the first time in, in history, since they started recording statistics, mm. I think it was over half, of males 35 and younger reported not being in relationship half of men 35 and younger not in relationships so that means they're not dating don't have a girlfriend not married okay we have to decide is that a good or bad thing you know there's there's different ways of looking at and interpreting data data can always be interpreted from a lot of different ways so i'll bring my scientific background into it now but it but it is something to notice that it's never happened before so there is a story to it Another independent study from that found, and this kind of fits with the pornography one, that if something like well over half of young men, like 21 and younger, report not having had sex in the last year. Now, if you think about this, if you think about what, what Mother Nature likes, Mother Nature wants young men putting their penises in exactly. lots of vaginas, mm. right? Mother nature doesn't want men like me putting my penis in lots of vaginas. That's why men like me, our sex drive goes like that starting about age 35, right? And, and it, it, it gets steeper and steeper, you know, every year. That's just mother nature's way, right? It's how we've evolved. But so we've reversed the whole thing is now guys your age, my age, you know, with Viagra and all this, we're the ones, you know, learning how to get out and get a lot of sex. That should have been happening between 15 and 25. That's what the, a 15 year old body's built for. 
is to have a lot of sex. They're too stupid to do much of anything else. And that that is also scientifically supportable. That you know, the reasoning part of the male brain doesn't finish wiring up to about 25. Yeah. So that's what a young male is wired to do, to have a lot of sex. Now, here's the paradox that, that I tend to put the spotlight on. You know, we have all these swipe right apps. You know, a guy, women, people can go meet anybody anytime, 24 7. People right around the corner. Oh, look, there's somebody. We've got these apps. We got, you know, we got dating apps online. We've got pickup boot camps that men go to in droves. How many YouTube channels are there out there for men on how to meet women, how to pick up women, how to look up, how to, you know, so it's not like there's a lack of information or a lack of technology to get men laid and get them a girlfriend or a relationship. So we have to ask if it's not technology, if it's not information, what is it? What's happening that men are reporting? I'm not, I don't have a relationship. I'm not having sex. Now, I think pornography probably does play a lot into that, and I don't vilify pornography, but, you know, I call it safe sex. You can go get all the sexual variety you want, you know, in the privacy of your own home or, you know, <laughs> in the bathroom at work, on your phone, wherever you're doing it. You can get all you want, and sex with a real-life human being, for those of us who've had it, is messy, is messy. It never is. Sometimes it's spectacular, but most of the time it doesn't go quite how we wished it had turned out. Is messy. So yeah, we got this instant access to safe sex, easy sex. I, I think that's part of it. Um, I actually think part of the problem is hookup culture itself. If you can just get on social media, on on the apps, just constant access to attractive women. I'm mainly talking to men here, but there's actually the similar dynamic going on with women. They're not getting into relationships either. You know, they're hitting that 40 years old going, I guess I should maybe second guess my career and think maybe I better go look for a man so I can have a baby, right? It's happening to them too. Part of it is just culturally, we're not growing up very fast. You know, it used to be, like I said, you know, a 12 year old was considered an adult. My age is maybe 18 to 21. Nowadays, it's about 35 before guys, you know, actually think mature thoughts. So we're not growing up very fast either, okay? But I actually think that a lot of this hookup culture, that in the male mind, there's, whether we call it FOMO, fear of missing out, need for constant excitement, validation, it's almost like, well, you know, I've, I've got this one woman who kind of likes me, but, you know, I see, oh, she's hot, she's hot, she's hot. And if I wasn't in a relationship, I could have her. Now, maybe they would never even talk to that hot woman because it scares them. But but in their minds, they go, well, if I get into a relationship, you know, that's going to happen. Then you got all these online forums that are telling men, don't let a woman, you know, all, all these, you know, hypergamous women come, you know, tie you down and take your money and move on to a richer guy. Spin plates, keep them, you know, at a distance. And, you know, most of the red pill guys I know writing that stuff are married. Go figure. Okay. So there's just so much out there that men aren't maturing. We have easy access to pornography. Hookup culture says there's always another pretty woman that you can get on your app. Why would you settle for this woman? She may be great, but you might miss out on another, you know, hot woman that would boost your ego and give you some sense of identity. And women have their own fear of missing out. It's usually missing out. of If I just get with one guy, I got to go off social media and all these apps and I won't get all that constant attention from men I've been getting. Right. So they've got their own stuff. But since I'm, we're talking to men, we'll focus on that. So. I think what's happening is, is that we've just created this perfect storm that men don't have to grow up. I, I'm not saying every man should get into a relationship. I'm not preaching monogamy. I'm not preaching lifelong, you know, monogamous relationships with the same sex. But I am, I do believe that there's something about conscious relationships, whether they're monogamous, open, whatever, that 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 are powerful personal growth machines that will grow us like nothing else can. But if we're just, you know, avoiding every one of them like that, we're just staying little boys. We're staying in the nursery. I, 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 I think, talk about masculine initiation. I think it's when we finally learned how to show up consciously with a woman that we actually start growing and really developing 
that those masculine temperament and skill sets we need to succeed in the world. But if we're if we're just you know keeping women all all at this you know arms distance, other than mm -hmm. let's just hook up with them and then move on, uh, I think we're missing out. I think we're missing out. Part of the problem in the United States, um, and I read something else recently that said up to 50% of relationships in the United States now are beginning on apps. And the reason I quote the United States is because whatever happens there will generally follow in the Western world. Now, the problem is that if you have, if you're dating a girl for a few months or something, and you have that uncomfortable patch, it's too easy to get back on that bloody thing. And there's 10 or 15 new options and Always. go back to the, or the problem is you're starting again from zero. Yeah. Every time you do that, and what people, what men need to realize in women is you're going back to the start of the monopoly board. And well, you're not going back, through. going back to the hormonal Childhood. stage that, that, mm. that feels exciting. You know, mm, feels like, yeah. oh, you know, yeah. is this going to work out? Is she going to get back to me? Is it, and, and that starts stimulating dopamine hits dopamine. in the brain, maybe the adrenaline and the cortisol. And we can get addicted to that adrenaline and cortisol. They're both stimulants. So stimulants are highly addictive mm. where we just need that constant. Oh, I need that hit. Now, I'm going to throw one other piece out because I've been kind of saying this on, on, on interviews a little bit lately. And maybe I'll start a movement. Nobody's going to follow me. I've been telling men, especially young men, social media is feminizing the constant need for, before, yeah. for, for, for connection for mm -hmm. validation for likes for just looking at pretty women for just even taking in information everything is pushed to you so you're actually in a feminine state you're in that receptive being filled state i ask guys how productive do you tend to be after you get off social media do you, do you take all that stuff from Uberman Lab, all that stuff, you know, from Tim Ferriss, all that stuff you've been reading? Go, I'm going to go fucking put a big dent in the cosmos. No, we just go look for more because mm. it's easy. It's easy consuming information. It's easy looking at pretty women on Instagram. It's easy doing this. And I, I never liked social media, you know, in its basic form. If it's just a good way to connect with friends, wonderful. But that's not what it is anymore. It's just driving ads at us and just, you know, got algorithms to just keep pumping the, you know, create an echo chamber to just keep sending the same thing. And so when I see a man, I don't, I don't know, I don't actually know what men are doing when they're on their phones like this. I, I guess they're scrolling through their Instagram account. Oh, that, that. that. They could oh, be swiping oh, right or swiping left on Tinder or, or something. If they're doing this yeah. or this, there's two different behaviors. Right? Yeah. You know, and, and so I'm not trying to vilify social media. I'm not going to vilify pornography. But I'm not sure either one of them serve men well. I'm well, not sure they take us where we want to go. There's a brilliant line in No More Mr. Nice Guy. And I wrote it down here because I wanted to wanted to make sure we get it in. Where's my where are my glasses gone? And it's related to pornography. You, you, you know when you're at a certain age when you got to get out the reading glasses <laughs> yeah. to read it. Um once once they have repressed all of their life energy, there is little about them to get anyone's attention or turn them on. Yeah. Okay. And that's a that's a line from No More Mr. Nice Guy, and it is related. Like you are releasing all of your masculine energy, all of your energy, if you are indulging in that stuff. And it's just really important to be mindful. It's, of that. it's, it's dissipating energy and tension. And again, I think that's one of the things masculine initiation does. It teaches you to live with tension, mm -hmm. to circulate tension, to sublimate tension, transmute tension into power. And mm -hmm. into things, whether it's getting you to the gym or, you know, getting that that new business launched or or getting that book written or, you know, you know, going for that promotion. If if we're dissipating tension all the time, we become tension adverse and you don't live your best self. You don't get out of your comfort zone until you get comfortable feeling uncomfortable. And so everything we do that relieves tension, I'm, I'm OK with tension releasers. I, I like to read, you know, you know, I, I, I like to read fiction. Most men don't know what fiction is. You know, we're, we're either reading self-help books or marketing books, but fiction is just, is my way of just, ah, you know, relaxing. And, and that's okay. We need it. You know, watching a favorite show on Netflix. That's okay. Getting on the internet for 15, 20 minutes. That's okay. There's no, no issue with that. But when we get into that mode, when our first impulse is just without even thinking, we just open our phone up. Maybe it's even reading news, sports scores, Instagram. Does all of that stuff improve our life in any way whatsoever? 
it's consumption. It's it, we're consuming. We're not building. It's we're not creating. Pushed and, 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 it's yeah. being pushed. We're not. We don't have to even go pull any of that to ourselves. It's pushed at us. Mm. So, again, I'm not vilifying it, but it is so easy to just get caught. You know, and and I'm told that TikTok has just mastered the dopamine hit of social media. You know, I think it actually began with MTV in in my era of just you know shows that just kept flashing scenes, changing it like that, highly sexual. All of a sudden, media learned. Even football games, U.S. football is now broadcast like an MTV video, it, you mm. know, moving around, cutting, cutting like that, because it just keeps hitting the dopamine responses. It keeps us from having to just, you know, we men don't handle tension. You know, our, our sporting events have a clock on them. Our, our our action flicks have a clock. Even baseball, American baseball has a clock on it now. I think that's sacrilege. You know, we're not comfortable with our tension. So, Again, I think that's what we can learn from masculine initiation is how to get comfortable feeling uncomfortable, how to feel tension, how to circulate it in our body, how to use it to move us forward in powerful ways, rather than how do we go dissipate it, you know, through ejaculation, through social media, through looking at porn, through watching television, through marijuana, through alcohol, through video games, you know, that's all just dissipating the energy that's meant to move us into our masculine purpose. If you were advising, uh, essentially giving a young man essential advice, say he's in his 20s, he doesn't have a lot of experience, what, what is the essential advice you would give for dating? For dating. You know, I didn't learn to date till I was in my 40s. Um, I, I wrote my dating books in my 50s. So I, I spent most of my life with nice guy seduction. You know, treat a woman well, listen to her, talk about her problems, and then stay with them forever. Right? Mm -hmm. I often joke that my, I was married to my first two wives for 25 years. I should not have dated either one more than three dates. Not that they're bad people. They just want good matches, right? But I've, I've got a woman. I better stay with her. So when I started consciously dating, trying to become a better picker, better ender, and just learning dating skills, the path that I took, I'm not saying this is the right path, but I really worked at becoming what I now call a social animal. I started just getting out in public and being in public situations that forced me. It didn't force me. I chose to interact with people, whether that's interacting with the barista in the coffee shop or the person sitting next to you on public transportation or a person in an elevator. I started interacting. And so through my Dating Essentials for Men courses and, and podcasts that I created um, and the books, I, I, I closed out every podcast with, with the following mantra get out of the house. I tell people, miracles happen around people. Unless you got a living room full of people, you're not going to have any miracles. Mm -hmm. That means get off social media, get out around people. Now, this was tough during COVID, but I think we're past that. Get out of the house, expand your route. Most nice guys, most men go to the same place all the time. Go different places. Go, go have an adventure where you're out of your comfort zone. Expand your route. Linger in public. Take a book. Take your laptop. You know, I, I, I learned, I just would take my, my Sunday New York Times. I'd take my laptop and just work in public. Uh, so I, I made Starbucks my office, right? So linger in public, talk to the people you meet. That means just, hey, how's your day going so far? You're no agenda, not trying to make anything happen. Not to, and I teach men how to test for interest. How do you know, does this person you've just started an interact, how do you know if they have interest in having an uh, ongoing interaction with you? And then I say, walk through the open doors of opportunity. I think that's the most organic, natural way to meet. I met a lot of male friends that way. I met a lot of uh, great women that way. Um, a girlfriend I had several years ago, I met her when she sold me shoes at Nordstrom. And so we just got to talking. I asked her out and we dated for a few years. Uh, another woman I dated, she was my, my interior decorator. And, you know, we were going out shopping for furniture and I asked her out and we dated for a few years. My present, my wife, Lupita, I was just walking down a street in Puerto Vallarta, headed to a Starbucks, when I heard a voice that said, hola, senor, want a massage? And mm -hmm. I said, no, hoy, tal vez mañana. Not today, maybe later. Kept walking. I thought, well, I liked her voice. Turned around, walked back. How much? And six months later, she asked me out, basically propositioned me. I said, let me take you out. And then we've been married for seven and a half years now. So all of the the core relationships in my life, many of the men, many of the women, I met just by being out in public and engaging with people. This is how you do it organically. 
Uh, unfortunately, whether it's social media, whether it's the, the, the dating apps, it's inorganic. Everybody puts their best picture up of them. The women put up their sexiest picture of them. Guys lie about their age. You know, it, it's just, it's just, the, it's, it's nothing real or authentic about it. And again, it's just, a, it's just that addictive dopamine hit of swiping. I don't, I think the success I've experienced in life over the last, say, 20 years, since I got divorced, 20 plus years, has primarily come from that path of being that social animal, just being out in public, just, just knowing how to interact with people. Uh, it makes you interesting. It makes you attractive. It brings good things to you. When I heard you say that first um, a couple of years ago, that landed like a punch. You also mentioned the fact that um, you interact without having an outcome. Yeah. Outcome agnostic. No yeah. Attach you know, the Buddha said that attachment's the cause of all suffering. The root of all suffering, yeah. I add to that, it's also the cause of all anxiety. And, and I tell men, men will ask me, well, you know, what do I do when I see a girl across the room I like? And I go, what do you mean you like her? Well, you know, I like her. I want to talk to her. I go, how do you know you like her? You don't even know her. Well, you know, I, I, I come on. You think she's hot. Okay. okay, yeah, she's hot. So we've already got an attachment. We already think she's hot. We think it'd be great to have a girlfriend like that. We think it'd be great to have sex with, with a hot woman. Yeah, yeah, of course, I guess those things are great. Um, I've been with some pretty attractive women. I don't know that I'd rate them as the best in bed. Um so I, we assume it's got to be good, right, to have a hot girlfriend or to have sex with a hot woman. So we want that one. We're already attached to an outcome. We're already going to be anxious. Yeah, you can learn all kinds of behaviors and techniques and approaches to kind of move you through maybe that. But no matter what, if you approach her for no other reason than because you think she's attractive, you've already made her the alpha and you're the beta. beta. She's the decider. She's going to decide where this goes from there. Again, I, I, I don't, I'm not opposed in, you know, practically to, you know, men talking to a woman because she's pretty, but I found you're much more effective if you're talking to everybody. Now, not literally, men do take that literally. I have to talk to it literally everybody. No, just talk to people. Talk to more people than you're talking to right now, right? Mm. Well, should I go talk to 10 people today? <laughs> just talk to more people than you're talking to now right and and then then you realize oh that woman i was just talking to she was attractive and she's the kind of woman i would used to have walked across the room or i would have been afraid to walk across the room to talk to and i tell men if you wait till you see a woman you're attracted to to work on your social skills you either won't do anything or whatever you do you'll rush through it bumble your way through it and a woman will go uh, uh, no thanks you know <laughs> get away so, it, but if you're the social animal, that just everywhere you go, you look like you own the room. People, you know, I've, I've, I've been with women that you go places with me and go, you fucking act like you own the room. People treat you like you own the room. And I go, hmm, okay. <laughs> yeah, you just kind of shrug it off. Yeah. And, and there's just something about having that social confidence that you can go into any environment, be social, that is just highly attractive to the feminine. And mm -hmm. and it will, and the guys go, well, but I, I want to be with the hot women. I don't want to date if I can't have a, I go, that's like fucking saying I'm not going to drive unless I can drive a Bentley. You know, start with a Honda Civic, work up to an Accord, maybe a BMW 3 Series after you've been at it for a little while. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you start out with, I have to date the hottest women if I'm going to, well, you're not going to do anything. And, and you're going to be that statistic of the 35-year-old dude that isn't in a relationship but looks at a lot of porn. That's what's mm. going to happen. What does the two last questions? What does the future hold for marriage and relationships? And um, what does the future hold for Robert Glover? <laughs> let's, let's do marriage and relationships first. Oh, uh, well, both both of those could be big questions. Um, you Is know, it dead? Is the institution finished? Um. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a good pro, 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 no, I'm a good procrastinator, but not a good prognosticator. That's the word I was looking for. Never stand in line behind me at Costco. Do they have Costco in Dublin? You know, is, is no, it, I always get I in the wrong. So. I get in the, that's the best line I get there. Oh no. They're now going to count all the cash out. You know, I always get in the wrong line. I'm not a good predictor. 
right? Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I should have bought Microsoft stock at twelve dollars this year. I didn't, you know. So I'm not a good predictor. Part of our human drive is a drive for connection. I think we will always be dr driven to connect and desire to be in relationship of some sort. Now, whether or not that is uh, pair bonded, same sex, monogamous, exclusive, you know, or, you know, op with the opposite sex, heterosexual, well, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. I think the human nature is we'll always want to connect. What form that will take, uh, I don't know. Now, what I would love to see is it take a very honest form. Again, I know a lot of people that are open in their relationship. I know a lot of people that are monogamous. I, I have no dog in that fight. But can you be honest and transparent and, and conscious and use it as a way of growing you? I think we'll always have need for relationship. Excuse me. I think the bigger picture of all everything we've been talking about I think we're actually in a healthy pendulum swing. I think we were at one extreme over here years ago with the whole patriarchal thing, you know, the, you know, the patriarchal men, dependent women is swung over here where everything masculine is toxic and, you know, social media, you know, blowing air. I think we're actually, and I don't think we're swinging back to a happy middle ground. I think we're swinging up actually to a new higher place of being. I see people becoming more wanting to be conscious opening consciousness up with plant medicine, the psychedelics, you know, going deeper into themselves. I, I actually, I think we're going in a good direction. I really do believe that. What that will lead to, I, I don't know. I, 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 I won't really predict that. I, I can't. Um, but but for, I think we're moving in a good direction. Yeah. And for Robert Glover? Oh, Robert I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. But aren't you, aren't you, what's the, what's the t-shirt you're wearing? Isn't this your men's, your men's group? This is, this is my men's program. You know, I, I launched this in July of 2023. Mm. And um, just, just, just to give you my own uncertainty, about, about two and a half years ago, I thought, you know, maybe I, I'll entertain semi-retiring. I was about 65 at the time. I'm 68 now. And uh, so I took three months off, did a sabbatical, uh, went camping, read books, came away from it, thought, well, there's a few more things I want to do. I want to like convert all my online courses to video, uh, some guy mentioned the idea of a membership program for men. I started looking at that. I already was in a process of getting all the content I've ever created, thousands of hours, audio, video, written, converting it to where it's now been transcribed. It'll be searchable, AI. We didn't even know AI would be able to do that two years ago. That's soon to be coming out probably this summer as part of Integration Nation. This is the community part of it, giving men masculine community, tribe, uh, masculine initiation. So I think it was a year ago, September. I'm still, you know, how how deep do I want to dive in? Do I want to maybe look at semi-retirement? And it just hit me that I got to get all in. So I said, I'm in for another 20 years. So I'm committed, you know, you know, Lord willing, I live another 20 years. I'm in. And, and so, because it didn't feel good to kind of, be kind of in, not in. I thought if I'm going to do it, I'm I'm bringing my whole soul to it. I'm I'm bringing every ounce of energy I got. Again, nothing hidden, nothing half-assed. If I'm doing it, I'm bringing my A game to it, and that feels better. So, in terms of my future, I still have probably a dozen books I want to write. Um, this has been very time-consuming, um, but I actually I think I'm starting to see maybe in the next twelve months where this gets a little bit more on autopilot to where I can just insert myself and teach and lead and be a visionary and do things like you and I are doing um, and start setting more time aside again for the books that I want to write. And one of them is, is a series of, of novels for young men fiction. Um, about fiction, developmental, all the stuff we're talking about, giving it to a guy, to young men, starting about age 11 through 19 and maybe five different books that bring them through all those stages of development. So I want to do that before I die. A few other books uh, I want to get out there. So my great desire is uh, stay healthy. You know, I've had a few scares over the last few years, but I'm in good health and, um, and, you know, really make this worldwide 
and make it available to every man that, that wants a community and get that more on autopilot where I can get those books written. So that's my desire. That, that, that's where I'm pointing myself. That's what I remind myself of every day. Well, there's, there's a huge army of men who will be re ready waiting with the checkbooks to buy uh, those books when they come out, Robert. So I hope nobody we get all uses of them. checks anymore. People oh, you know, it's a, <laughs> you know what I mean. The uh, reading glasses and checkbooks you're showing your age, right? <laughs> cryptocurrency. We we bind them with Bitcoin. Yeah, cryptocurrency. That's what we're going. You know, Doctor Robert Glover. Thank you so much. It's been a real pre uh, pleasure and a privilege and and fantastically insightful and. Um, yeah. Connor, this, this has been a choice. It's great to meet you. It's great to spend the time with you and look forward to possibly doing this again. Thank you.